Our next subject is the resurrection of Christ. Is Jesus alive today? Our speaker is Brother Michael Hatcher. He's been preaching something like, I think, what, 14 years now at Bellevue, thereabouts, 15, 14, coming up on 15, I think. He is a faithful gospel preacher, and I think regarding any of the preachers, I believe the thing that they would like to have said about them, but anything, is that you're a faithful gospel preacher and all that that means. We're so thankful, as was mentioned in the prayer, that he's undergone the surgery that he had, and he's uh, coming through it with, uh, I saw say flying colors, but at least uh, you're coming through it. He is uh, mending well, and the prognosis of his situation is a good one, and we have so much thankfulness to God to express along that line, and we do. Married to the former Karen Savage of Trenton, Texas. And uh, they have two sons, Andrew and uh, Daniel. Uh, he's a graduate of Harding College back in 1976. He served a number of congregations. We won't mention all of them. He's the editor of The Defender. You need to see him about getting that paper. If you don't get it, we urge all everywhere, on the Internet and so forth, to do that. He is a person who, out of conviction, stands for the truth regardless of the sacrifice. That's what we need today. We must have it. It can't be any other way than a person be what God expects of them. Be convicted by the truth and have the courage of your convictions based on the truth. And we're glad to have him come speak to us at this time on this very timely and important subject. Brother Mark, come speak to us. I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. And from a personal standpoint, certainly appreciate all of the prayers and cards, the concern uh, that was shown to me during my recent surgery and recovery. Uh, it is a wonderful thought to know of all of the people that are praying for me. do appreciate this congregation and their stand for the truth, uh, the elders of this congregation. Uh, last hour we saw the quality of men that comprise this eldership uh, with the fine lesson that Brother Jack brought. And the day before my surgery, I was having to be prepped for the surgery. And so I was not able to attend services. So I pulled up the website for the congregation here and enjoyed services of this congregation. I was able to sing the songs and go through the prayers. But, uh, when uh, Ken Cohn got up, well, let me just say that was a very moving experience. And I will leave it at that. <laughs> None of the others had that type of uh, reaction for me, though. But uh, you might say that, if it's the right type of um, getting ready for. <laughs> Major difference between Christianity and any other religious group is the historicity of Christianity, and specifically of Jesus of Nazareth and his resurrection from the dead. In Corinth in the first century, some were denying the resurrection of the dead. And so Paul shows the consequences of this view as he deals with Jesus of Nazareth and Christ's resurrection. And in that, he mentions some of the consequences 
if Christ was not raised from the dead. He says, starting in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 15, that if Christ be not risen, then our preaching, or is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You're yet in your sins. And they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And can I add for our lectureship here, all morals are vain. Because there are no morals if there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But Paul then states, but now is Christ risen from the dead. So we go back to this idea of the historicity of the resurrection. Was Christ really raised from the dead? Is it a historical fact, or was it just made up stories after the fact by his apostles as they wanted to gain notoriety or for whatever reasons? Is and was Christ really raised from the dead and thus alive today? If he was, then he is, as Paul says, declared to be the Son of God. Romans 1 and verse 4. And all should accept him as such and should accept the morality which he declares and which he sets forth within the pages of the New Testament. Brother Rex Turner set forth nine facts that were accepted by both friend and foe. The very first one is that both grant that a man by the name of Jesus lived. Uh, I listened to a debate just a few days ago in which an atheist denied that a man named Jesus lived. And so there are certain ones who are now denying the historicity of Jesus himself. But generally speaking, they will accept that a man named Jesus lived. Both grant that he rose to great heights of prominence, particularly among the common people. Both grant that he suffered the crucifixion of the Roman cross and was thought to be dead when he was taken from the cross. Both grant that his body was buried in the new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Both grant that a great stone was laid at the mouth of the tomb. Both grant that the seal of the Roman governor was affixed there too. Both grant that a Roman guard consisting of from 15 to 60 men were stationed about the tomb. Both grant that sometime after the third morning, the body of Jesus disappeared. Both grant that his disciples came to believe with unshakable confidence that their Lord had been raised from the tomb by the power of God. So those are nine facts which Brother Turner says basically are accepted by everyone, whether foe or friend. And so using those as an accepted standard, we come to the question, as to what happened to the body. Because Jesus was crucified on Friday, died that day, Joseph of Arimathea took the body along with Nicodemus, prepared the body, and put it in Joseph's own new tomb. On, Saturday, on uh, Sunday morning, some women went to the tomb, but the tomb was empty. What happened to the body? Before we really get into the differing theories as to what happened to the body, though, let's notice a couple of things, and because there's some other ideas that are floated around every once in a while. Would it have been possible for the women to have gone to the wrong tomb? In other words, they just got confused. 
as to the, where the burial place really was. I don't have time to really develop this fully, but that's an impossibility. Just think uh, everyone was interested as to what was going on at this time. They knew his prophecies. Uh, they were interested in Jesus. Everyone knew he had been crucified. Everyone would have known where he would have been buried. Everyone knew all of the events that were taking place. There's just no way that there would have been confusion as to the burial place of Jesus. It's just an impossibility because of the widespread knowledge of the, of the events. Also, it was a new tomb, meaning that there's no other bones that are in the tomb, and thus could not be confused and have other bones there and say, no, there's the bones of Jesus, even though he had been raised from the dead. That's being a new tomb is important. There was a huge rock that was rolled in front of the opening. It was of sufficient size to make several women wonder who's going to move it for us. So it was a huge rock. There was a guard that was placed there. You will recall that the chief priest, the Pharisees, went to Pilate and asked him for a guard. And Pilate gives them the watch with the statement, you have, a, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. As I read that, I wonder in my own mind if Pilate was saying, go ahead, try your best, you're not going to succeed. And that he had placed an inkling of faith enough to state that he was going to be raised. Think about all of the events that will happen to Pilate and he might come to that conclusion. It might be just telling them, you take any precautions that are necessary. Go ahead, you've got your watch. Make sure that the tomb is secure. There's no way that the guards would have been guarding the wrong tomb. Can you imagine if you're one of those guards and you know the cost if you lose a prisoner? It was your life. So your life is on the line. You know why you're there because there's been these prophecies and they want to make sure no one comes and gets the body and that that body stays right where it is. Are you going to accidentally, or are you going to be guarding the wrong place? Or are you going to make sure of where you're guarding and what you're guarding? Their lives were on the line if they lost the body. They're not going to be guarding the wrong tomb. Yet, the third day the tomb was empty. The body is missing. What happened to the body? Well, there's only about four plausible are somewhat plausible explanations. The first is referred to as the swoon theory. And these are infidels that really did not believe that Jesus died on the cross. Carl Frederick uh, Bart, around 1780, suggested that Jesus deliberately feigned his death and that the physician Luke had provided him with some medicine or some drugs, and then later on, after he was off of the, the cross, Joseph of Arimathea comes and revives him. A little bit later, about 1800, Carl Venturini claimed that a group of supporters were with Jesus, and while not expecting him to survive the crucifixion, yet they heard some groanings from inside the tomb that Jesus had regained consciousness because of the cool, damp air in the tomb. And so they scared the guards away. <coughs> Why are you laughing? I mean, 
these guys were serious with this foolish, I mean, this, uh, these great intellectual thoughts. <clears throat> but they, scaring the guards away, then rescued him. Henrik Paulus advocated very simply that Jesus had fallen into a temporary coma. And then, again, in the tomb, he revived. In early 1830s, Frederick Schumacher endorsed a form of Paulus's theory. This idea of the swoon theory has cropped up every once in a while through the years, but really it's not given too much support or thought. Uh, and I think, very simply, the condition of Jesus' body disproves this idea. Remember what all Jesus went through. In the garden, prior to his arrest, he endured a state of uh, hematidrosis, uh, also called hematohydrosis. And I'm no medical doctor, and I have enough in, uh, problems with speaking English. So if I'm mispronouncing these names and words, well, that's too bad. <laughs> I'm doing my best. But uh, it's basically stating that an individual is in such agony that the stress causes him to literally sweat drops of blood. Um, while the blood loss in that state is very minimal, the skin, at least, becomes very tender and sensitive. Uh, you, then after his arrest, he endures five trials, and during those trials he is slapped, he's beaten. He endures a Roman scourging, a scourging that would kill many individuals, as these Roman soldiers would sometimes one, sometimes two, standing on each side. And they would bear the individual, uh, take the clothes off of his back, tie him up, and taking a whip with leather tongs attached, and at the end of those leather tongs, uh, steel balls would be attached to it. And they would then beat that individual First, those steel balls causing bruising and then bursting as a result of the continued beating to where literally an individual was, became one mess of blood and skin and ligaments and sometimes bone, their own bones because their bones are broken. many individuals died from just a scourge. After that, the soldiers place a robe on him and along with a crown of thorns. Crown of thorns, the thorns would be about an inch in length, not the type of thorn that are on our rose bushes, but uh, these were lengthy. They were about an inch long. Then, also, the crown of thorns was not so much a wreath that would go around the head, but more like a helmet that would cover the entire head area. Then the soldiers took rods and literally would beat the thorns into the scalp. Of course, if uh, in that beating, the rods would come in contact with his head as well. This would cause not only great pain, but a large amount of bleeding as well because of all of the blood that goes to the head area. He would then be made to carry his own cross probably just the cross beam or the patibulum, which would weigh from 75 to 125 pounds. 
We have a song that says that he fell beneath the load of the cross. The Bible never states that. However, what we do know is that the Romans would make the individual who was going to be crucified, the condemned man, carry his own cross. Yet we know from the biblical record that they compelled Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus' cross. Is it very plausible to thus assume that he did fall under the load of the weight of that cross after what he had been through? That's certainly not uh, an idea that's totally unfeasible. If that is the case, falling under the weight of that type of a crossbeam would very possibly cause blunt chest trauma or a contused or bruised heart. Those are the events, just some of the events, prior to the actual crucifixion itself. Then, during the crucifixion, of course, an individual would be spread. Is the individual would take a spike and nail the spike through what we would refer to the wrist. It, they would refer to it as the hand. First one side, then the other side. He, they would take the feet then and place them pointing down, one on top of the other, and drive a spike through his feet and into the wood. They would then raise up that cross, and they would scoot it over and let it fall into the hole that had been prepared for it, thus pulling and jarring the individual against the, those spikes. He would then hang there, suspended between heaven and earth. The only way that an individual on the cross could breathe was to push himself up, putting all of the pressure on the spike that is in it, his feet. And he would be able to breathe a little bit at that time before he would then slump back down with all of the weight resting upon his wrist at that time. And it was literally a period of time in which they would push themselves up and fall back down, push themselves up so that they could breathe again and fall back down. An individual being crucified often lasted days upon a cross, records of even over a week, nine, ten days in this type of a situation. But the Jews didn't want these individuals hanging on the cross on their holy day, the Sabbath, and so they get them to break the legs. Well, breaking the legs would cause it where they could no longer push up to get the breath, and thus they would die quickly. But they come to Jesus, and they found him already dead. To make sure of his death, though, a soldier then takes a spear and thrusts it into his side and out flows blood and water, showing that Jesus was dead, that there was no doubt of the death of this individual. Pilate is surprised by such an early death when Joseph of Arimathea comes to him and asks him for the body. So he calls in the centurion to ask him, has he already died? Now then, think, is that centurion so stupid that he doesn't know whether a man's dead or not? Remember, these soldiers were experts in death. This wasn't something that was uncommon to them. They executed hundreds and thousands of people in this manner. They would know whether or not an individual was dead. There's no way that the centurion would make such a stupid mistake. And thus, Jesus did not simply faint or feign his death so that he could get out of the crucifixion. 
he died upon the cross. So that really is not a theory that is given that much credence. A second idea is that, well, his enemies stole the body. When you look at uh, actions, many times you have to look at motives. What is the motive for an action in a court of law? The prosecuting attorneys many times go to, here's the motive. And through that motive, they then establish that this individual had a motive to do this crime, and thus he is guilty. If there's no motive, you start wondering, why, did he, why are you accusing him? Why would he do it then? What would be the motive of the enemies of Jesus? They wanted him dead. They didn't want him alive. They wanted him in the grave. And as long as he was in the grave, his enemies were victorious. They won the case. So it was exactly, the body was exactly where they wanted it. They had no intention of removing the body. They had the intention of making sure it stayed in the grave, not to steal it. They are the ones who come to Pilate, remembering that Jesus has prophesied about his resurrection. And so they say to Pilate, let's put a guard there. Make sure that no one can come and get the body. Now, if they're planning on stealing the body, why would they go to Pilate and ask for a guard? They don't have any reason to steal the body. But also, the enemies of Jesus never claim to have the body. In fact, they spread the rumor, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus came by night and stole the body. But think even more so. For example, on the day of Pentecost, here's the apostles getting up and they are preaching a great gospel sermon how that these Jews who by wicked hands had taken and crucified Jesus, God has raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. If the enemies of Jesus had stolen the body, what would they have done? Ha ha, you foolish guys, here's the body. They would have produced it. Or think uh, as those Jewish leaders, the days wore on. Peter and John are called up into the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin says, you're not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Don't preach his name. Don't preach about him. They let them go. They go right back to continuing to preach them and preaching that your Jewish leaders have crucified an innocent man. They call them back up before the Sanhedrin. And notice what the Sanhedrin says in Acts 5 and verse 28. Did we not straightly charge you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You're accusing us of murder. Now then, stop it, because here's the body. <laughs> That's what they would have done. They would have produced the body. They didn't do it. If they had produced the body, which they would have done if they had had it, if they had stolen it, it would have been the end of Christianity at that point in time. The apostles would have lost all credibility because here they are saying, we are witnesses of the resurrected Christ. No, you're not. You're liars. That's what they would have been if the enemies of Jesus could have produced the body. They couldn't because they didn't steal it. Thus, the claim of the apostles, or the claim of the enemies of Jesus, was that the apostles came by night and stole the body. So there's the idea that is presented that his friends stole the body. Now, 
There's an interesting admission, though, in making this statement. Because they make the admission the tomb is empty. They had to explain an empty tomb. And some individuals that come along a few thousand years later and want to say, no, the body never was missing and all this, no, the enemies of Jesus prove by themselves that the tomb was empty. So we have to face the Roman soldiers now because here's the Roman soldiers who are also now announcing that his friends come by night and steal the body. While we slept. Can you imagine? Here they are with the charge, guard the tomb. And they sleep while on duty. These are Roman soldiers. They're not people like me who'd sleep at night. And I'd probably fall asleep when you're given the charge. Uh, maybe not, but there's a possibility. But these were Roman soldiers. They're going to sleep. But even if they were asleep, how did they know that the body was stolen? Can you imagine coming into a court of law and the prosecutor swears them in and they're sworn in, the prosecutor starts asking them, body was stolen, yes. It was stolen. While you were asleep. Yeah, while we were asleep, it was stolen. How do you know? You were asleep, weren't you? Maybe they slept with both of their eyes open. If they were asleep, how did they know who stole the body? They claimed that the disciples came by night and stole it. How do you know that it was the disciples if you're asleep? And then, again, remember we're dealing with Roman soldiers. Wouldn't the event that would take place in the stealing of the body wake up these men? Also remember, when we're dealing not only with the Roman soldiers, we're not only dealing in how many times we see pictures of the empty tomb and there's one guard or maybe two guards there. Remember, we're talking about 15 to 60 guards. All of them are asleep at the same time. And all of these events that are going to happen, the unsealing of the tomb, so they had to get the tomb unsealed. Then there has to be the moving of this huge boulder away from the door of the tomb. Remember, there's these women that are coming to the tomb on Sunday morning, and they're wondering how in the world or who's going to move that stone for us. And then the commotion of going in and getting the body and dragging the body away, all of those events and none of the soldiers are going to wake up during these things? No, it, that idea is ludicrous. And in the court of law, they would be laughed out of the courtroom. But also, what did the disciples supposedly, since they stole the body, what did they do with it? Why wasn't the body found? I mean, you got a dead body now. you got to do something with it. Where was it? What happened to it? Why would the chief priest and the elders pay the guards? Here they went into Pilate. Ask the governor, give us a guard to make sure that no one can steal the body. And now then, these men who have so utterly failed in their duty, and they're going to be paid. You, would you pay someone who totally, completely failed at what you had asked them to do? And... Look at the guards. Why would they have to be bribed to tell the truth? 
if the disciples actually had come and sold the body, why did the chief priests and elders have to, or Pharisees have to bribe them to tell the truth? How many of you have to be bribed to tell the truth? Hmm. No, you don't have to be. If the disciples stole the body, then they would have to invent, invent the resurrection story. It would also have to be consistent between all of them. Remember, you've got at least 12 men, and there's a whole lot of other witnesses other than just the apostles, but just dealing with 12 apostles, how many times do you think you can get something consistent between 12 people? But it cannot be identical. It can't be an identical story. Because then you tend to disbelieve the evidence if it's identical. Why? Because that shows that they got together and made up the story. So it has to be consistent, but it cannot be identical. Then what motive would they have had? Generally, you, again, you look for a motive. There would be no motive for them to have stolen the body, nor would there have been any advantage to them in stealing the body. In fact, it was a disadvantage, at least from a physical standpoint. They were persecuted, tortured, put to death, all because of what they know is a lie which they fabricated. No, reasonable men don't do that. Look at the disciples, though, after Christ's death. They did not really expect him to rise from the dead the third day. Yes, they, I, they did believe in the general resurrection, that he would be in that general resurrection. But they didn't really believe that he was going to rise from the dead the third day like he did. They were a group of men who were beat, who were defeated, they had been demoralized by the rest and the crucifixion. Remember, they ran away in the garden. And there's Peter denying the, his Lord because, yes, he had been, gotten caught by those because he got a little bit too close. And so people started asking him. In John, the 21st chapter, Peter, along with other apostles, said, I go fishing. There's the possibility that he was saying, I'm going back to my former occupation now. This is done with. It's over with. In John, the 20th chapter, in verse 19, they hid for fear of the Jews. That's their attitude during that time. Joseph and Nicodemus prepared the body against corruption, not for resurrection, on the resurrection day when the women came to the tomb. It wasn't expecting a resurrection from the tomb. It was to, again, anoint the body with spices. When the women tell the apostles about the empty tomb, it says in Luke 24 and verse 11 that it was as idle tales, and they did not believe them. Notice Mary's response first to the angel that tells her, woman, or asks her, woman, why weepest thou? And she said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. She didn't expect him to be raised. She expected him to be dead. And then when Jesus, in John 20 and verse 15, says unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She then responds to him and says, thinking that he's the gardener, Sir, if thou hast borne him, away, borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Did she expect the resurrection? No. They did not expect that. At the ascension, even, when Jesus was ascended back to the Father in Acts 6, the first chapter, in verse 6, they were wondering, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They weren't 
thinking about preaching the resurrected Christ. They were going to restore that physical nation of Israel. That's what they were thinking of. Not going out and preaching the resurrected Christ. But then notice the change that comes over these men. And the point is, there's no way to account for a change. From the, that group of demoralized individuals to men who became strong, courageous, when they were persecuted and threatened, they remained faithful to their testimony that Jesus was raised from the dead. From a historical standpoint, all of them except for John suffered martyrdom for that testimony. Men are not willing to do that for a lie of their own making. This accusation that the friends stole the body of Jesus just is without any credibility whatsoever. The only possible explanation is that Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God. The apostles affirmed, testified, gave their lives for that testimony. And I think it was an interesting comment that Paul made to King Agrippa in Acts 26, chapter and verse 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? If God has the power to create this universe, and he does, if God has the power to create this world and all of the things that are in it, and he did, if God has the power to create man, and he did, why should it be thought a thing incredible that he would be able to raise someone from the dead? And he did. And he is our Lord and our Savior. Thank you. People need to be hearing more of the adequate evidence and credible witnesses that are available to testify to the existence of God and the deity of Jesus Christ that includes, of course, the resurrection of Christ. I was uh, thinking that a good point was made early on in this sermon relative to how one studies the Bible or principles of rightly dividing the word of truth or ascertaining Bible authority is in the matter of uh, Jesus uh, carrying his cross. Matthew and Mark and Luke tell us that it was Simon of Cyrene, and you put it all together, what they said, and it's coming out of, his own, out of the country, gives father's name, uh, and they laid hold on him one place. Another place says they compelled him. They didn't want to do this. They made him. But it's John that tells us that Jesus was bearing his own cross. And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke says that they, is they led him away to crucify him. That's when you find Simon. So what do you do when you put the totality of the information together on the matter of the cross? They led him away to crucify him, bearing his own cross, but then they compelled him. Let's say he fell beneath the load, but it says then they compelled Simon the Serena to do it. So uh, that shows you how that you've got to approach the Bible taking all of the facts in the case recorded by the inspired penman before we conclude whatever it is. And three of the books don't tell us that Jesus was bearing his cross. John does. And of course that's somewhat peculiar to John uh, having in John things that others don't mention. And I thought that was very interesting, came to my mind when you were preaching that. Very good lesson and we appreciate that very much. We'll stand adjourned for about 10 minutes and then please come back. Uh, remember the ladies may not.